In 1713, the Englishman magazine ushered a new word into the English language, orrery. It was taken from the name of the Earl of Orrery, who put up the money to build a machine like this, a mechanical depiction of the Earth's movement in the solar system. The motion of the universe itself, laid bare by Isaac Newton's work on gravity and cosmology, had been put into miniature order. An age of reason was attempting to bring order to everything around it. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, a series of self-appointed authorities tried to tame the unruly English language. It was a heavyweight contest. The age of reason, which began in the late 17th century, was born out of years of massive political upheaval in Britain. It had seen civil war, during which the king left London and set up court here at Christchurch College, Oxford. The war made familiar such words and phrases as roundhead and cavalier, plunder, iconoclast, cabal, regicide, lord protector, commonwealth, restoration, papist, nonconformist, keep your powder dry, and warts and all, a lexicon of faction and dispute, often mortal. The philosopher John Locke was educated here at Christchurch and lived through this turmoil. He developed his greatest work in the 1670s and 80s, an essay concerning human understanding. In it, he argued that better use of language could put an end to disputes and factionalism if the definition of words could be agreed and misunderstanding avoided, peace would naturally follow. It's a wonderful example of rational idealism. Did John Locke, a man of such supreme intelligence, really believe that by getting the language clear and the arguments stripped to basic simplicities, then, as he put it, disputes would end of themselves? Clearly he did. There is blind faith here at the heart of what seems pure reason. It's a fascination in this story, though. The men of Locke's caliber did think that, in effect, language was the master of life. Perhaps it could rule everything. Locke was a member of the Royal Society, founded in 1660 to promote what we call science, but they called physico-mathematical experimental learning. They tried to write pure and simple English, to avoid what they described as this vicious abundance of phrase, this volubility of tongue. At the time, learned books were usually written in Latin, because Latin was understood internationally and was regarded as more precise. The members of the Royal Society wanted to make English a fit language for scholars, and English began to make inroads into the territory of Latin. Newton had published his Principia Mathematica in 1687 in Latin, but in 1704 his Optics was published, written in English, a new kind of rational English, larded with terms of inquiry and argument. I proceeded by this analysis to discover and prove the original differences of the rays of light, in respect of refrangibility, reflexibility and colour and their alternative fits of easy reflection and easy transmission, and the properties of bodies both opaque and pellucid, on which their reflections and colours depend. Here was a new vocabulary of reason and investigation. Refrangibility and reflexibility were words coined by Newton to allow him to describe his experiments with refraction and reflection. Transmission had been used before to mean passing from one place to another. Newton changed its meaning to describe passing through a medium. And opaque had meant unlit for 200 years before the 17th century changed it to mean not allowing the passage of light. The word lens had only been coined a decade before Newton used it in his book. And as he reported his observations, he also gave English the terms indistinctness and well-defined. The scholars were reframing, redefining, and refashioning the language. They made it part of their apparatus, and there's another word that took on its meaning as the equipment for an experiment during this period. 
there appeared to be a growing and general confidence in the state of English. Printing presses were no longer licensed, and they had spread and proliferated. For the first time, daily newspapers were being printed and circulated. Reports of events around the globe went into the hands of ordinary people. The fashionable meeting places of the day were the coffee houses. It was in places like this that people read and talked about the news. This one sold coffee until just a decade ago. Now it serves up stronger fare. Printed English had become part of the fabric of daily life, as it had never been before. Here's the first issue of the Daily Current for March the 11th, 1702. The news comes from the war of the Spanish succession, that the French have sent over 20,000 troops to Italy. There was a massive appetite for this news. Joseph Addison told the readers of his magazine, The Spectator, that different papers cooked to the same news in different ways, and that no one could bear to leave coffee houses like this one before they'd read all the different versions. But coexisting with the exuberance of Grub Street and the coffee houses, possibly as a result of it, there was a deep anxiety about the state of the English language. There was no royal society here protecting English from vicious abundance of phrase and volubility of tongue. There was no John Locke pressing the case for agreed definitions and clarity of meaning. The greatest worry was that English itself was changing. The poet Geoffrey Chaucer was still revered three centuries after he'd written the Canterbury Tales, but by then he'd become difficult to understand. The satirist Jonathan Swift, writer of a series of bogus travel diaries we know today as Gulliver's Travels, voiced his concern. How then shall any man be able to undertake his work with spirit and cheerfulness? when he considers that in an age or two he shall hardly be understood without an interpreter. The aristocracy couldn't be relied on to set the example. Swift hated the vulgar liberties, as he saw it, that they were taking with the English language, the way they clipped vowels out of words or abbreviated them, rep for reputation, pos for positive, incog for incognito, and the one that survives as standard English today, mob, from the Latin mobile vulgus, the common people. In coffeehouse society, Elegant English was supposed to consist of long, Latinate words. These shortenings were considered crude. And Swift also hated what he thought of as merely modish words, like banter, bubble, bully, cutting, shuffling, palming, and sham. Swift found a model in the classical languages, Latin and Greek. Those languages, it was thought, had survived because they never changed. They were carved in stone. Swift would save English by arresting it, putting an end to changes. He would take control of English and take it away from the anarchy of the upper-class bloods and their slang. In 1712, Swift proposed the foundation of an academy for correcting, improving and ascertaining the English tongue. The academy would replace the aristocracy. Ascertain was a big word. English was to be fixed, ascertained, forever. No matter that the French and Italians already had academies that had failed to hold changes in their languages, Swift's determination was ferocious. One critic sneered that he was attempting the impossible, and he said, may as well set up a society to find out the grand elixir, the perpetual motion, the longitude, as to fix our language beyond our own times. Well, he was wrong about longitude. Swift even took his case to court and proposed his scheme to Queen Anne, saying that only classical English would endure to report her glory. But she died two years later, and her place on the throne was taken by George I, the German king, who spoke little English and cared about it even less. Swift's plans were dead. But English fielded another champion, an intimidating scholar, the monarch of London wits, a beacon of his age, a savage melancholic, and like Isaac Newton, an effortless eccentric. He lived and created his masterwork in this house in Gough Square, just off Fleet Street, in London. Came the hour came Dr. Samuel Johnson and his great dictionary. He thought he could write it in three years. When it was put to him that it had taken 40 Frenchmen 40 years to compile their dictionary, he replied, 40 times 40 is 1,600. As 3 to 1,600, so is the proportion of an Englishman to a Frenchman. In 
in fact, it took him seven years. And this is where he did it. In this garret on the top floor of this house, he fed material, 43,000 words and definitions, etymologies and quotations showing how they were used to six assistants who wrote them down. Johnson's achievement with the dictionary was immense and immensely idiosyncratic. He left out proper names. He included obsolete words if they were found in authors not obsolete and was criticised for including archaic words such as digladation, cubicolary, incompossibility, jobbernal and opiniatory. He confessed to omitting words he couldn't explain because he didn't understand them. In a manner which would enrage and amaze all future lexicographers, he acknowledged that many terms of art, manufacture and trade are omitted, but for this defect I may boldly allege it was unavoidable. I could not visit cabins to learn the miner's language, nor take a voyage to perfect my skill in the dialect of navigation. His dictionary is lacking in the areas of law, medicine and the physical sciences. He left out rude words, and when two society ladies asked him why, he responded, what, my dears? Then you've been looking for them. The dictionary was finally published in two folio volumes in 1755. And this is it. With all his omissions and banishments, it's a wonder that the dictionary carried any weight at all. In fact, it carried immense authority and also served a purpose of national pride that English literature could boast such a mighty engine of words and through the genius not of a French committee, but of an English individual. We like that. And the personality of that individual shines through, willful, prejudiced and learned. The dictionary becomes an autobiography, a portrait of an age, and a book that remains entertaining way beyond its useful life as a tool. Though it has to be admitted that as a tool it doesn't stand up by modern standards. Some of its etymologies, accounts of the origins of words, are questionable, and its definitions don't always shed light. Cough, a convulsion of the lungs, vellicated by some sharp serosity. And dross, he says, the recrement or despumation of metals. Sometimes they're biased or inaccurate. Oats, he describes as a grain, which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. Tarantula is an insect whose bite is only cured by music. Dull, he says, is not exhilarating, not delightful, as to make dictionaries is dull work. When he began his work, he sounded very much like the inheritor of Swift's great plan. The idea, he wrote, was to make a dictionary by which the pronunciation of our language may be fixed, its use ascertained, and its duration lengthened. But after he'd worked on the dictionary and come to write the preface, his pragmatism and his honesty saw a rueful but radical change of mind. English wasn't going to be tied down. No dictionary, Johnson added, could embalm a language and preserve it from corruption and decay implying that for Johnson, like Swift, change was still for the worse. But I think there's something to celebrate in the end of the idea of trying to fix the meaning of words. English would never be lashed down, and the power of its freedom gave it, I think, an extra cylinder when it came up against the obstacle or the opposition of other languages. Goat, a ruminant animal that seems a middle species between deer and sheep. Electric. Attractive without magnetism. Petroleum is a liquid bituary, black, floating on the water of spring. Enthusiasm, a vain belief of private revelation. Lexicographer, a, vain confidence a writer of dictionaries, a harmless drudge. Johnson's work won both brickbats and garlands, but it was rarely ignored. There was praise from the two European countries which had established academies to regulate their language, Italy and France. A French journal declared that Johnson himself was an academy for this island. And although it didn't fix forever the meaning, or in Swift and Johnson's word, ascertain a single word, the dictionary is still read and enjoyed in all its eccentric, dusty glory. The second half of the 18th century was an age when nature itself was being put into classical order by landscape gardeners like William Kent, here at Rousham in Oxfordshire. And a host of grammarians, led by Robert Louth, wanted to do the same to the English language. From now on, things were different from, but certainly not different to, the old individual freedoms. In some ways, they added clarity. In other ways, they created pedantry. Between you and I was outlawed. Between you and me was now the only way. 
Comparatives were to be used with a pair of objects and superlatives with more. The better of two, but the best of three. Incomparables like perfect, unique or round weren't to be qualified, so you should no longer be more unique or less perfect. Lie and lay were distinguished from each other, as were will and shall. Perhaps surprisingly, Louth recognised that a preposition was permissible to end a sentence with, though avoiding it was more elegant. That where two ways of using language existed, one must be wrong. They carved a single path through the thickets of English grammar, and they began to turn their attention to vocabulary. There were attempts to ban popular words and phrases, words such as fib, banter, bigot, fop, flippant, flimsy, workmanship, self-same, despoil, nowadays, furthermore, wherewithal, subject matter, drive a bargain, handle a subject and bolster an argument. All of them had to be wiped out. Hating English words and phrases isn't as common as liking them, but the flying squads of opposition are always with us and sometimes let it be welcomed. Today, some people object to what they see as the misuse of hopefully, as I do, instead of I hope, to the way Decimate is losing its meaning of to reduce by a tenth, or the use of ahead of instead of before. There's a sense in which they can't fail and they can't succeed either, because English will find its own words. The language itself, through usage and natural selection, will see what is survivable and what will not survive. The 18th century was a paradise for the terrible twins, class and snobbery. And in they came, pat on cue. The new rules and regulations were immensely influential, not for the upper classes, who felt no need to change the way they used English, or for the lower classes, who had little incentive. But the growing middle class, or the growing number of people who wanted to be middle class, regarded knowledge of the rules as the key to joining polite society, a badge of entry to the club. One typical example was William Cobbett, who became famous as the author of Rural Rides. He was a lower middle class boy who took a copy of Louth's grammar and taught himself the rules. And he put his reasons bluntly. Without understanding grammar, he wrote, you can never hope to become fit for anything beyond mere trade or agriculture. It's impossible for you to write correctly, and it is by mere accident that you speak correctly. And pray bear in mind that all well-informed persons judge of a man's mind until they have other means of judging by his writing, or speaking. Writing or speaking. The word police were also turning their attention to the spoken word. English reached the Scottish lowlands not long after the first Anglo-Saxon invasions in the 5th century. As it replaced Gaelic as the language of lowland Scotland, it took on a character of its own. The English-speaking Scots took up words that were unknown further south. Contact with the French produced bonny from bon, achette from assiette for a serving dish, and fâche from the old French fâché, meaning to annoy. I remember it being in common use in the borders in don't fâche yourself, meaning don't get agitated. The Dutch gave the Scots callant, which became callan, meaning lad, Mutsekin, which became Mutchkin, a quarter pint, and the Dutch golf, a stick or a club, is the probable origin of the Scottish invention golf. And there were hosts of words from the Gaelic Cairn, Cayley, Claymore, Gilly, Glen, Ingle, meaning a fire and a half, Strath, a wide valley, Loch, Swaran, and Whiskey. And as well as words, the Scots had their own ways of talking. Okay, yeah, I want you to try some of the sausages, please. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the apricots in there. I'm not sure about that. Along with the neeps, that is fantastic. Then had the next portion, uh, and the whiskey had nothing to do with it. In 1761, Thomas Sheridan, Irishman, former actor, and a self-appointed master of elocution and pronunciation, came to Edinburgh. He was on a mission to teach the Lowland Scots how to speak English properly. It's hard to believe that there could have been a sense of inferiority among the great and good of Scotland in the Age of Enlightenment. This was one of Europe's intellectual powerhouses. And here at Edinburgh, the Signet Library is filled with the fruits of their learning. The philosopher, David Hume, the economist, Adam Smith, the engineer, James Watt, the architect, Robert Adam, the geologist, James Hutton, and the historian, William Robertson. They were the first among many equals. But there was a sense of inferiority, and it lay in their use of language. Since the Act of Union in 1707, Scotland had been part of a united Britain, 
A new idea had swept through the whole country, the idea that there was only one proper way to speak English. The idea was partly the result of the spread of the printed standard English. More people than ever were reading, but they weren't reading the local dialects they'd grown up hearing. There'd always been a gap between what was said on the page and what was said on the tongue. But now, in what could be called the great print shift, the printed version started to be regarded as correct. In short, the best spoken English was increasingly supposed to sound like the best written English. But what did written English sound like? And who decided? One simple idea was that words should be spoken with all the written letters sounded, which was fine <laughs> as long as you could read, but it outlawed those clipped pronunciations that Swift had so hated. It put waistcoat back in favour instead of waistcoat, for example, and put chimney back where many people prefer to say chimney. But it was no help in deciding how to pronounce the A in fast, bath or last. Fast, bath or last, long or short. Both had champions, and the argument has lasted, or lasted, from the 18th century to the present day. And what about the many inconsistencies of English spelling? The relationship between sound and spelling in English is a nightmare. Our written system isn't phonetic to the point of being antiphonetic. There are, for instance, at least seven ways of representing what for most people is the same vowel sound, E. Free, these, leaf, Field, seize, key, machine. What do we do? Or take the letters O U G H in cough, tough, through, thorough, bow, thought. The same four letters, six different sounds. Dr. Johnson had omitted pronunciation from his dictionary and wrote that trying to fix it was like trying to lash the wind. But that didn't deter others. The Irish actor, Thomas Sheridan, spotted the need for a national elocutionist. He seized the role. Sheridan's first and crucial book was published in 1756, hard on the heels of Dr. Johnson's dictionary. He called it significantly British education. Not English, an education. No messing about with ways of speaking or pronunciation. He went for the key and jugular word. If you wanted to say what you said in the best way, then what you needed was an education. And this book, this man could provide it, which remarkably he did. Sheridan toured England, lecturing to appreciative middle-class audiences. And then he was invited here to Edinburgh by David Hume, Adam Smith, and other members of the city's leading debating club, the Select Society. Pronunciation is a sort of proof that a person has kept good company and on that account is sought after by all who wish to be considered as fashionable people or members of the beau monde. The task, the task was the last that the past master could grasp, but one can't mark, mark his charm harmfully. Sheridan hit a nerve. The Scots intellectuals were worried about appearing uneducated. The task was the last that the past master could grasp, but one can't mark his charm harmfully. OK, let's hear you all together. Look at the cookbook. Look, Look at, at the cookbook, cookbook said, said the cook, cook as he took the pullets and put them in the nook. Sheridan's great idea was that if everyone spoke in the same way, they would talk to each other as equals. Of course, it didn't work. The new standard immediately divided people into those who copied it and those who didn't. Look at the cookbook, said the cook, as he took the pullets and put them in the nook. But some Scots were affronted by the very suggestion that their speech was inferior. They needed a standard bearer, and the post was not empty for long. Robert Burns was born in 1759 to a poor tenant farmer and worked as a ploughboy until he was 15. He loved women to excess, he loved Scotch, he loved Scots. He published his first collection in 1786, poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect and was canny enough to leave out some verses which he'd written in more standard English. It was a shrewd move. The Scots had found someone to make them proud of their own language. He came to Edinburgh and on his first visit stayed here at Lady Stairs Close. He was fated, patronised and ruined perhaps as the ploughman poet. He died when he was only 37 but his legacy is vast, 400 songs some of which are recognised as masterpieces, the Lee Rig, Tam O'Shanter and the Red Red Rose. 
10,000 came to pay their respects at his funeral. And that was only the beginning of a reputation which is kept alive wherever Scots with even a smattering of literature meet to talk of Scotland, drink whisky, and toast the ladies and the haggis in Burns's tongue. Fair fire, your honest sonsy face, great chief to know the pudding race. A boon them I, you tack your place, paints triper therum. We'll are you worthy o' a grace as long as my erum. Just south across the border from the lowlands where Burns spent his youth, lie the fells, the Norse word for mountains, which form the Lake District. They nursed and nourished another poet who sought out the common experience, William Wordsworth. Wordsworth wrote down a lot of his work in this small cottage in Grasmere, which used to be a pub. He liked to use this chair with its flat arm to work on his poems. Poetry, once the preserve of the highborn or the high-flown, was being stormed by romantic and revolutionary language. His contribution to English poetry has been well and widely cherished. Wordsworth's contribution to the adventure of English is that in the preface to his lyrical ballads, first published in 1798, he stressed that poetry could be written in the language really used by men and didn't need a special poetic diction to express deep feelings. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? Up, up, my friend, and quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. The sun above the mountain's head, a freshening luster mellow, through all the long green fields has spread his first sweet evening yellow. Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy planted their garden here behind the cottage, with wildflowers they found on their walks rather than with cultivated hybrids. It was much the same with the language of his verse. Poetry wasn't supposed to use such simple language. Dr. Johnson had said it clearly. The most splendid ideas drop their magnificence if they're conveyed by words used commonly upon low and trivial occasions, he said. And Johnson thought that Shakespeare had ruined the tone of Macbeth by using the word knife, a tradesman's word used by butchers and cooks, as he put it. Wordsworth warned that readers who were used to what he called the gaudiness and inane phraseology of many modern writers will perhaps frequently have to struggle in reading his work, struggle with feelings of strangeness and awkwardness. They will look around for poetry. Books, tis a dull and endless strife. Come, hear the woodland linnet. How sweet his music. On my life there's more of wisdom in it. And hark, how blithe the throstle sings, and he is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things, let nature be your teacher. Wordsworth was reviled for many years by critics and other poets for daring to bring poetry to the voice of the people, in a way to give it back to its bedrock of Old English. A few years before, in 1790, Thomas Paine had written The Rights of Man, also in the plain style, to demonstrate that simple language could carry precise thought. That a work of such influence on political ideas, and a young poet who was to exercise even greater influence on poetic practice, should agree, opened up what's become a major thoroughfare for the English language. Despite its exhilarating taste for excess, obscurity and the arcane, its promiscuous nature now led English poetry and prose to the depth of meaning and feeling and nuance which could be mined from plain English. It's possible to imagine a world without the influence of Paine, Wordsworth and their followers. And one of its aspects would be that a language separate from ordinary English was the only language in which high thinking and profound feeling could be expressed. There's a sense in which Wordsworth kept English true to its old, tried and tested self. He saved and celebrated and gave lasting literary energy to the ancient language of ordinary speech. One impulse from the vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good than all the sages can. Meanwhile, away from Wordsworth's simple rusticity, among fashionable and elegant society, how you spoke was a key to your social standing, and nowhere was more fashionable than Bath. If you could not talk properly here, you were inviting ridicule. 
Richard Brinsley Sheridan, son of Thomas the Elocutionist, set his comedy The Rivals here and gave us one of the most ridiculous speakers of English in its history. There, sir, an attack upon my language. Oh. What do you think of that? An aspersion upon my parts of speech. Was ever such a brute? Sure, if I reprehend anything in this world, it is the use of my oracular tongue and a nice derangement of epitaphs. The glorious Mrs. Malaprop, under full sail, putting the wrong words in the right places. Her name comes from French, mal a propos, meaning inappropriate. It entered the dictionary in 1849 as malapropism. Make no delusion to the past, she says, and she's as headstrong as an allegory on the banks of the Nile. She could represent Sheridan's dig at his father, Thomas's pedantry, but she's also a reflection of a society in which the education of women was widely thought to be unnecessary. But that was changing. Richard Sheridan's grandmother had had no education, but his mother was an accomplished writer. At the turn of the 19th century, more and more women were reading as well as writing. Subscription libraries were making books widely and cheaply available to more and more readers. Female readers created an appetite and a market for novels, works of romance and sensibility which earned little respect or no respect among intellectuals. Yet out of this atmosphere and out of this city came a woman who helped the novel to be recognized as writing in which wit, brilliance, depth and variety could find expression every bit as impressive as could be found in the more established forms of poetry and drama. The novel, especially her novels, became the benchmark for good English. She was, of course, Jane Austen, whose prose was to clarify the English of that Enlightenment romantic era to a crystalline standard never achieved before and rarely since. In a way, she became the Academy Dr. Swift and Dr. Johnson had dreamed of. And what are you reading, miss? Oh, it is only a novel, replies the young lady, while she lays down her book with affected indifference or mounting shame. It is only Cecilia or Camilla or Belinda or, in short, only some work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humour are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. The world of Orson's novels is one in which a single man in possession of a good fortune is in want of a wife, and a single woman in want of a husband in possession of a good fortune but they have to prove themselves worthy to each other and to society. They are judged. There's a whole lexicon of social acceptability in Jane Austen's work, words like agreeable, appropriate, delicacy, discretion, eligible, order, propriety, respectable, and unfit. Yet Jane Austen has her boundaries. The language of the streets is kept firmly outside the Austen door. The language of bodily parts was not allowed in the Austen parks and drawing rooms. In her own way, Jane Austen was every bit as masterful and controlling as the men whom time has seen her surpass. Her own proper and correct use of English has permeated the minds and sensibilities of hundreds of thousands of her readers. Swear words would never do. The human body had become the great unmentionable of Jane Austen's time, and to deal with it, English had produced a fantastically inventive list of euphemisms. These are all polite terms for the male organ from popular speech or writers of the 18th century. Not that Jane Austen or any of her heroines would have let them pass their lips. Tailpipe, Pilgrim Staff, Captain Standish, Silent Flute, Pike of Pleasure, Mutton Dagger, Cupid's Torch, Chink Stopper, Nimrod the Mighty Hunter. His Majesty in Purple Cap, Beloved Guest, Picklock, Pleasure Pivot, Pump Handle, Dear Morsel, and Dr. Johnson, because there was no one that Dr. Johnson was not prepared to stand up to. It can seem comical today, as though avoiding the word could avoid the thought, but that's a testament to the power of language. It was all part of putting English in its place. English was treated by the self-appointed censors as if it were an unruly mob, a subversive faction, a party of revolution. And reputation was no armour against their assault. It was the 18th century that first took the scissors to Shakespeare, removing hundreds of lines with words like whore and strumpet and devil. This prudery, as we would see it, was a product of the society whose idea of elegance and decorum had produced Johnson and Jane Austen. It was the ultimate result of Johnson's notion that language was the dress of thought 
and that heroic sentiments were degraded by common words. Remove the words, remove the thought. But English wasn't going to lie down. Johnson, remember, had also objected to the use of trade terms. Trade terms had no place in Jane Austen's world, but trade terms were about to reinvigorate the English language. In 1756, the Scottish engineer James Watt was working on improving the steam engine. This is a model of one of his designs. Watt was very tight-lipped about his ideas, but one of his friends reported the work to another of his friends. The condenser's the thing. Keep it but cold enough and you may have the perfect vacuum, whatever be the heat of the cylinder. I also learned that the great difficulty was to make the piston tight. Piston, cylinder, condenser, this is the new language of steam power. And in the same recollection we read about the eduction pipe, the steam vessel, the reservoir, the air pump and the siphon. English was called up for the new technology. Watt's condenser was the key to efficient and practical steam power and it changed the world. revolution had arrived. The machines of the 19th century are still a great attraction, as we can see here at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. But now, they're historical curiosity. Then, they were the cutting edge of technology. In 1851, the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations opened in the purpose-built Crystal Palace in London's Hyde Park. It was a display of manufactured goods of all kinds, and the greatest attraction was the machine hall. Queen Victoria was an enthusiastic visitor. In a lengthy and acutely observed diary entry, she wrote, excessively interesting and instructive. Here was every conceivable invention. Here were some of the industrial worlds and the English language's newest arrivals. Hydraulic power, centrifugal pump, lithograph, electroplating, dynamograph, and grandest of them all, Anhydrohepsoterian, which cook potatoes in their own juice. Practical inventions frequently roped in familiar terms. The men who built the machines were often clock and watchmakers by trade, and they brought their language with them. Wheels, teeth, pinions, leaves, pivots. Beasts of burden lent their names to the mechanical beasts which were replacing them. There was the donkey engine, which had its output measured by the new standard of horsepower. In the cotton mills, there was Samuel Crompton's spinning mule, and other inventions including the roving billy and the spinning jenny, which may be derived from the common names for male and female animals, as in billy goat and jenny ass. But the classical languages, Latin and Greek, were also employed by scientists, either through diffidence or wishing to claim a distinction for their discipline which matched anything in antiquity. They took the Greek terms logos, meaning word, and nomia, meaning distribution, and named new fields of inquiry, ologies and onomies, like biology, petrology, taxonomy, morphology, paleontology, ethnology, gynecology, histology, carcinology, agronomy, geonomy, phytonomy, and entomology. In the first part of the 19th century, these islands had become the world's leading scientific and industrial nation, and the language became an engine which drove it forward. Engine is a word with a long history in the English language. For instance, in the Middle Ages, it meant skill or talent. Then it became a machine, a weapon or a snare. Now it became part of the steam engine or the locomotive engine. And then in 1829, the word locomotive itself shifted and stood alone as a noun. The railway brought new meaning to a whole set of words. Track and line were both applied to the metal rails. Their junctions became points. Coach, carriage and wagon all left the road and rode the rails, while lorry began its life as a railway word and made the journey in reverse. Stations had been places for ships and troops before the word was first applied to the building behind me, Liverpool Road Station, here in Manchester.
And behind the locomotive was the train of carriages, a line of them, in the same way that English had spoken of a train of followers, or the trailing train of address. Within ten years of its first use, the train meant the locomotive as well as its carriages. The world was on the move, taking words and their meanings with it. What chance now of the 18th century ideal of ascertaining or fixing it, when words were dealing with so much that was new? Other words were shifting in meaning too, reflecting massive social changes. Factories had been foreign trading stations in the 17th century. Mills had once been places to grind corn. Now they both meant places of manufacture, and they were getting larger. The word industry had moved away from the idea of individual diligence or work and come to represent a whole institution. So had labor and capital, as the forces they described gathered pace. These aren't simply changes in the meaning of words, they represent changes in people's lives, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. In the mills, it was often children who took the cans of cotton fiber from one machine to the next. If output slowed down, blame was leveled at the child who carried the can. Some workers, like those at Quarrybank Mill at Style, were fortunate. They had model cottages built for them. But tens of thousands learned a new word, a word that English picked up off the London streets from the slang of the poor, and that word was slum. The economic miracle of the Industrial Revolution was also a curse. There was squalor and poverty on a scale never seen before in cities, especially in London. English was using a new word to describe social status. Instead of old terms like degree, status or rank, it now had class and the slums were the realm of the lower classes, the working classes. The 18th century ideas of proper speech became stronger than ever, as the language police sneered at urban working class dialects such as Cockney. Would the Cockney speech of that time, of the 18th century, have sounded very much like the Cockney speech today? What would have characterised it? Typical features would have been the alternation of f and th. So, for example, um, a pronunciation like bath would have been very characteristic of Cockney of that time, as opposed to bath, which would actually have been a much more refined pronunciation of what we now would say as bath. So it's, a lot of the markers shift their values at that time. Um, another very typical one, often regarded as a kind of vice of the Cockneys, as by John Walker in 1791, was the alternation of V and W. So a word like well would be pronounced as vel, for example. Um, this was very much a, a living reality of Cockney speech throughout the late 18th century and into the 19th century. But Cockney was regarded as uncouth, wasn't it? It was regarded as a sign of not being educated. It was looked down on. No, Cockney was certainly regarded as uncouth. It was um, the speech, as another writer said, of the vulgar provincialists of the metropolis. I mean, it was, it was something that was lacking the educated, literate proprieties which people regarded as the kind of norm to, it to be aimed for. Do you think, it, in the end, it was disabling to our society that that's what so many people were concentrating on so very much? There was a, a, certainly a kind of barrier generated by this, the image particularly of the accentless voice. I mean, obviously, the accentless voice is, is a kind of myth. Everyone has to speak with an accent. But the, this barrier erected between those who had managed to shed a regional accent and those who then had acquired what we call the non-localised accent, a, an accent that didn't reveal your place of birth. And, and this set up quite a, a sort of problematic fault line in society, which people strove to try. Cross. You should have put your iron boots on. In 1851, the journalist Henry Mayhew identified a new kind of London talk, a cadger's cant done on the rhyming principle. I was elephants last night. I'm just going to go around a jack hauler. You haven't got any prime mash, have you? Prime mash? I lent you a cockle last night. I can't keep giving you cuds. Deep sea diver? No, not today, mate. Have a good job. That old Amos again. Fuel in what, what can I say? I'm going down to Frog and Tote. And uh, meet on, keep out the battle cruiser and stay up the Amos. All right. Cockney rhyming slang became the most relished characteristic of Cockney. Its wit and innuendo still give it life today.
Dinky Doos, Q's. Marsham will be uh, Bobby Crush, Mash. Great, there'll be Aerie Oak. Donkey Barrow, Mara. Like, like you say, with the trousers, like Lionel Blair's, Flair's, Clear Anus trainers, City Snickers, Knickers, Earth the Kits, Tits. Slang is a code, a way of a group speaking to itself without being understood by the rest of society. So it's constantly reinvented. In Victorian times, there were many such codes where hidden meanings could flout conventional respectability, and one of them was found in a music hall. Mary Lloyd was once criticised by the moral watchdogs for singing She Sits Among the Cabbages and Peas. She responded by changing the words to She Sits Among the Cabbages and Leeks. Two hundred years after John Locke's call for meanings to be defined and clarified, none of the self-appointed guardians of English had been able to tie it down. Words continued to change, to take on new meanings, to hide their true faces behind a mask of respectability. Here, at Locke's Old College, Christchurch, Oxford, in the 19th century, Charles Dodson, a mathematics lecturer, invented a fictional character who would have given Locke nightmares. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Dodson is better known by his pen name, Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland. When he wrote Through the Looking Glass in 1871, he took English further than slang and into the realms of nonsense. This is the opening of Jabberwocky. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave." All mimsy were the borogoves, and the moam wraths outgrave. The only interpreter of this verse that Alice can find is Humpty Dumpty, who defines words just as he wants to. Locke and the language police who came after him would not have approved. It's nonsense, but intellectual nonsense. A clever game with words, quite different from the way the lower classes speak, according to an article that Dodson wrote. A word means what the speaker intends by it, he wrote, and what the hearer understands by it, and that is all. This thought may lessen the horror of some of the language used by the lower classes, which is often a mere collection of unmeaning sounds. By the end of the 19th century, attitudes to the class system and language had been tightly bound together. The upper classes spoke clearly and were intelligent leaders. The lower classes grunted and were stupid brutes. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech. That your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible. And don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. The story of Shaw's play Pygmalion is well known. A professor of phonetics finds a cockney flower girl here in Covent Garden and coaches her to speak English like the upper classes. What isn't so well known is that Shaw had a serious purpose. He thought that the general public obeyed the ruling classes because they expressed themselves so elegantly, so authoritatively. Even their bad ideas sounded convincing in upper-class English. And when the play was produced in London in 1914, there were plenty of bad ideas around. The well-spoken politicians were on course for the First World War. Shaw wanted his play to show that there was no magic in good speech. He even thought that if he could break the spell, he might prevent the war. The play caused an uproar, but not because of Shaw's ideas about class and pronunciation. He broke one of the cardinal rules of polite society at the time. He put a rude word on stage. I must go. So pleased to have met you. Are you walking across the park, Miss Doolittle? If so, I Walk? Could... Not bloody likely. I am going in a taxi. That one word, bloody, was the talk of the nation. It caused so much fuss that it erased Shaw's serious message. When the First World War broke out, Shaw could only regret how, as he put it, war can so easily be guilt with romance and heroism and the like by persons whose superficial literary and oratorical talent covers an abyss of godforsaken folly. Two centuries previously, the Age of Enlightenment had dreamed of order and of a unified language, ending conflict. But it was the First World War that would begin the long decline of the social order and its idea that you were a better person if you spoke proper English. <laughs> 